Hello and welcome to Old Tunes Fresh Takes. This is the podcast where we learn old tunes, record fresh takes of them and challenge you to do the same. This episode we're back with Anna roberts Givolt to listen through your takes of The Wife of Us as well. A few weeks ago we released part one of this episode where we introduced the tune and talk about some of the themes and challenges it presents. If you've not heard that, we recommend you go and give it a listen before carrying on with this part two. There'll be a link in the description. We've had some amazing takes on this song come in over the past few weeks. Big shout out to everyone who's taken part, including Asymptotes, Catafolk, Kerisafana, Ian Jackson, John Don Piver, Kev Pritchard, Rory Wells, Harry Orme, The Monkey Town Milk Spillers, Steve and Paul Moisey, and Matt Milton. We'll be playing a clip from each as we discuss them. If you'd like to listen along to the full takes with us, there's a link to the playlist in the description to this episode. They're all brilliant, so definitely worth having a listen to the whole playlist. I'm Jack the Robot. And I'm Tim Woodson. Let's crack on. Anna, thanks so much for coming back on the show. It's great to have you back. It's lovely to be back. It's been a pleasure thinking about the wife of us as well over the last few weeks or month or however long it's been now. Just sit in darkness. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Have you had any more thoughts about the song, either of you? For me, it's uh, maybe just more that this song has quite quickly become a bit of a favourite now, which is really nice. Oh, good. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, it's really grown on me as it's gone. Really good tune. That's cool. I was, um, I watched an episode of Insecure, which is an HBO show by Issa Rae. The last episode of the fourth season is kind of this group of friends are trying to find one of the friends had a child and has postpartum depression. They can't find her and she like goes out and she like gets drunk and she gets some junk food and like they find her at a hotel eventually. Kind of there's a bit after of the the directors talking about portrayals of postpartum depression and it just was interesting to hear these very modern these storytellers of a tv show on hbo talk about this kind of mother grief i just feel like i've been thinking about these like where do these themes come up because i feel like there's a few ballads like the cruel mother but also this one that are dealing with like the grief of of parents it's Mm. it's interesting yeah 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 yeah, I, I, we watched uh, Your Honor a couple of weeks ago. It's one one kid ends up killing another kid. The kid he kills ends up being son of a notorious gangster. And so the series is about that this kid father kind of covering up and trying to try to cover up for that. I mean, the twist is he's a judge, and so he's like holier than thou, having to break all the rules and and whatever. I think what what happens when you when you start working on a song like this is that you start it kind of really pulls out bits of culture where where these stories are uh kind of really highlights them i think mm-hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm my mind's been sort of activated anytime any sort of parent child loss relationship comes up definitely. right right so you pick up on it more yeah. i think so yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah so i think that it's doing its job you know <laughs> it's yeah. like one yeah, yeah, yeah. you know all of these stories whether it's a tv show or a song it's they're like they're holding I feel like I saw a post from Rianne and Giddens recently of of how kind of this idea of like a fragment like that there's like a a a seed in each of the songs like a clue of how Mm. to deal with things like no song is is the answer that but but each song or little story is or narrative is like a a little clue about how to deal with it Mm. and I just like that idea of this constellation of of little clues or little little fragments of, yeah, of like ways little, to deal with things, like a little patchwork of uh, yeah, like a little quilt of how to how to navigate life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a bit of a weird thought quite early on in the month. Stick with me here, but I okay. was thinking about how like the three babes could be seen as a metaphor for either the song itself or like music sort of like a ghostly apparition coming along and providing some consolation, but it comes to an end. And um, I just thought that was quite interesting. I also like it because then like whatever mystical force brings the babes back is the artist. And then that's us like all powerful, like that's conjuring. Beautiful. Like, yeah, yeah. There, Yeah, there is a conjuring. You can really interpret them as they're not babes anymore. They're angels, they're ghosts, mm. they're witches. Mm. But I love that idea of thinking about a song as a form of conjuring mm. it's quite beautiful yeah yeah a, a puppet master actually sort of sim- i guess sort of similar to what you do with your light box i rewatched that mm-hmm. uh, the, the one you did with npr tiny desk with yeah. that box that that's a similar sort of idea like right. real conjuring that i think it's great cool so tim you've called your take we can't uh, eat your bread should we have a little listen now yes. yeah 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 
Lovely. I think it's great. I think it's a really, really interesting reworking of it. Do you want to tell us like how you got started? Or sure. So quite directly inspired by the the sort of ideas we were talking about. Um, Anna, you mentioned about like a like a music crunk rap piece of like laying plates down, and I thought you know that's a cool idea. And you know I've been wanting to muck about with found sounds for a while. This seemed like a great uh, great idea. So I just set up a mic in my kitchen. Just went about finding finding noise, making noise. My favorite one, incidentally, is a uh, salt grinder. Oh right, uh, and it's like it's really crispy, and it's like it's quite unsettling. Yeah, um, those sounds my... are so interesting and beautiful. ASMR sort of effect, right? Like <laughs> scratches the back of your brain, sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> I mean, the other main idea I had after I'd kind of collected these sounds and started arranging them was that. I was kind of interested in the idea of like grief as a cycle, as like a kind of thing that you get trapped in. Like initially, I wasn't sure I wanted to do the whole song. Mm. I thought maybe mm. I just want to zero in on, and in particular, this this scene in the kitchen kind of thing, this preparation scene. Uh, you know, I'm imagining this woman kind of wandering around the kitchen, kind of getting things ready hurriedly, but her head's kind of down. She's not really paying attention to what's going on around her. You know, maybe the, the lads are there in the room. So I came up with this round. Rounds mm. are cool, right? I'm bringing rounds back. <laughs> First, it will be sh- it was shanties, and then it will be. A <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah. all about rounds now. Frere Jaco, bring it, bring it all. Bring I'm sure it it's right for the TikTok format. Oh, as yeah. Well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, the other benefit of rounds is that uh, if you want to get that lush vocal harmony thing, but you don't want to do a lot of singing, <laughs> then you can you can do a round and then just copy and paste. And it's great. It, so, is that what you did? Did you copy and paste your vocals on top of each other or did you actually sing it for each of the parts? I did, but I also I ended up doing it twice just to okay. get a bit of variation between them. So it wasn't too blatant, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've I thought. Yeah, dramaturgically <laughs> just thinking about the story or if this is a small play I almost felt like I was a bit hearing like a fragment of an opera you know Meredith Monk's music is mostly taken from these larger pieces and so I was kind of thinking in terms of that like that this is this moment where you're only hearing her voice which I thought mm. was so strong and that the little melody break I, I thought of it as an instrumental in the middle is mm. like you can't hear the voice. It's mm. it's it's almost a little bit like the peanuts, but totally in a different energy, right? right? Where you can't ever hear what the parents are saying, but it's the opposite. It's like we can't hear the response. You hear like this echo of response. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was so strong that mm. it you're in this room with her sounds and her singing and her perspective and what else is out there is just you can't make out it's too mm. it's too fuzzy it's not it's not coming through the signal's not coming yeah, through yeah yeah and i loved the part at the end where you know the round is continuing these kind of co- commands requests these motherly mm. requests mm. and it kind of gets you to think like who is she actually talking to? And then is she talking to no one? And then as the reverb is opening up, you're like, it feels like there's this moment of she's like, will anyone hear me? Like, is there yeah, 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 anyone yeah. listening? Or yeah. So I really liked that because the original ballad is is a dialogue. Like you mm. hear her talk, you hear them talk, and this really cut out them talking. It was just like, here's her mm. request, here's her part of the dialogue and you we don't hear the other part and i that was really interesting and and well executed great uh, thank you very much yeah no i was i was kind of thinking with that last section it's this kind of contradiction of as the as the sounds are sort of opening out and getting wider and, and bigger actually she's going further in and it's almost like you it's almost like we've gone inside sort of some chasm within her i think is what kind of mm. what i'm going for yeah well, yeah isn't that so cool about reverb in a way right when you add reverb like 
theoretically, it makes the voice larger. There's more to tail to the voice. Mm. Yet it actually makes the, from a theater point, it's making the narrator smaller because all of a sudden mm. you're, you're revealing the space that they're in yeah. as much bigger. And so by, so they're like, oh, I'm, I'm small. Whereas, yeah. you know, when there's no reverb, it's, it feels very present. So it's just amazing how if we're thinking of it as a play, it's like creating this deep distance of mm. sinking back either into the the self, like like mm. her internal voice is going from kind of her mouth to like somewhere deep. And then, oh, mm. it feels like her whole body is this giant chasm of mm. despair. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I, what I kind of hope to get as well with the, so the lyrics I've got, they're all quite sort of, kitchen sink is what i was thinking of yeah kind of like very like earthy sort of colloquial eat your greens boys mm. uh drink your teas boys it's all stuff that's very familiar familiar to me i think in particular but i think the effect of the like the vowels and as it kind of gets higher and drawn out is it's almost like I, not it's not quite a wail but it's like that like you're definitely singing very much from the chest at that point i don't know i felt quite pleased with how that came together the, the effect on me of singing that felt like i was embodying it in a, in a mm. way uh which which was really important to me how did you yeah. get the effect on the sun's vocals tim what was it so i pitched it up an octave just singing that we can't eat your bread oh okay yeah uh, yeah right. was, is the verse and that's where i've nicked the title from you know and that's a very direct response to what she's saying in, in her round it's like we, totally. we can't eat this so yeah so I've pitched it up the octave and I've stuck on, uh, you know, again, quite a lot of reverb. I've had a lot of fun. <laughs> Ableton's done an update between the last mm. episode going out and now. And I've had a lot of fun with some new effects and things. So this is a, a particularly aggressive reverb called Verbatron. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> it's I Texas Gladden's also... favorite reverb. <laughs> <laughs> it's auto tuned, right? It's auto tuned. Yeah, using Little Alter Boy. Little Alter Boy. Yeah, it's by little Sound Boy. How fitting. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little Alter Boy's got a really nice drive setting on it as well. So mm. you, can, you get the you get the up the repitching, but you also get the this lovely sort of warm drive to it as well. And I felt like just all those things together really sat very nicely. And then you've got the melody also played on a on a piano, just sort of softly there in the background. Are there strings in there as well? There are strings, yeah. It's kind of one chord, but the notes are just randomized slightly, so you get a slightly different chord each time. Uh, that's another a new Ableton feature, isn't it? Yeah. Really repping the update here. Having a great time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's that's that piece anyway. Lovely. Off the back of what we talked about last time, you know, Anna, you said that you'd love to hear what people do if they can just do a, just do a completely a cappella take. And the effects I had, having got to the end of this version, is so I thought, well, I've, I've done all the kind of emotional legwork. I know what this song is to me now. So yeah. I felt like I was in a much better place to actually just do a straight up version. So I thought I'll just I'll just have what have a go. Um, Did you enjoy doing that? Yeah, it's great. As I've been getting more and more electronic with the stuff that I do, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about when we return to, to more live performance. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, it would be quite cool to have like a really electronic recorded set and then just a completely bare live set you know i've wanted to give this a go for a while this felt like the right kind of time to to have a go at a, a completely acapella take and i felt that's cool yeah. yeah i find that the more you're invested in the song the easier it is at least for me to be less <clears throat> self-conscious like trying to to sing a version of the ballad mm, mm. you're kind of like oh yeah no it's just i'm just telling the story it's cool yeah yeah so there you go. No excuses now. If anyone else feels like they want to have a go, you can yeah. do it. Have a go. You can do it. It's very. Do we do we applaud for each one? That was great. <laughs> yeah, why not? That was really that was really beautiful. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, had a lot of fun. Yeah, cool. Yeah. I'll go next. Yeah, Jack's cool. turn. I've got. I wish the city's flood. I'll listen to it again. I love this one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening.
Oh, Jack, Sweet. that the double kick just makes me <laughs> grin <Yeah. laughs> every time. I wonder if it feels like this, but it's a, it was felt to me a little bit like a collage of like all the ideas I'd had over the last few weeks. Yeah, I wrote down episodic. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, part of the thing was I was trying to like emulate a little bit of the slightly weird time signatures I was hearing, particularly in mm. the Eunice Yeats McAlexander version. I was hearing most of the lines in 4-4, four, four, but when the, then when you get to the last line, it's like it's in a 6-8 sort of thing. And I, and I also, you know, I only wanted to leave like two or three beats in between lines instead of a whole bar. I was doing everything I could to not have to hold sung notes too long because I can't <laughs> hold notes that long. So I need to just come off it really quickly. Yeah. So then all the time signatures ended up looking weird, which Ableton just doesn't like. I felt a little bit restricted by that. And then as I moved on, then I was my hand was sort of forced in certain ways because... If I wanted to make certain changes, then it would be like a big lot of I've got to change all these bar sizes mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, make sure everything's mm -hmm. really in line again. It's probably a real product of having to work around this grid system. Yeah. yeah. I remember when I was starting to do gigs like in Baltimore and New York and like do country songs and people would say like, how many, how many beats does that measure have? And mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know, just like follow the words. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, like <laughs> yeah. this. There was this kind of realization about how many, how much a lot of music is about counting and yeah. realizing how little counting I had done in right. the immersion in traditional music. Like, it's like, just follow the melody. Right, it's yeah. It's so melody driven and Ableton doesn't speak to that. Yeah, the like, computer just follow can't just the follow melody, the, yeah. <laughs> Hitting my computer, telling it to follow. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I think it was a bit of a product of that. The, ch the guitar is tuned down very low. I got these new strings, which are Ernie Ball heavy bottom slinky tops, which means I can... Yeah, it's a great name, right? <laughs> and the E string is tuned down to a B, so it's really far down. And it's... Uh, I, was, I was listening to Martin Carth Martin Carthy and Norma Waterson's take on Death and the Lady, and uh, like I was just trying to copy Martin Carthy's guitar for that intro guitar. Obviously not for the later guitar. <laughs> that wasn't very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved this version for so many reasons. You found these intense emotional moments in yeah. mm. that that are in the story. Mm. Like they're so there, and I feel like that was part of my frustration with just continuing on as simply a folk musician. Why I chose not to, where it's just. It's like, wait, when I experience grief, it doesn't feel like a nice song. It mm, feels like, mm. ah, like it, there was such a nice chaos in those beats or like doom metal vibes. Of yeah, it. And, yeah. and like, like imagining this as a do like a doom metal mm. song, like this is the deepest doom. It's like different um, genres ha have different emotional ranges mm. where they're really able to like highlight like a certain part of the emotion or something mm, yeah. yeah like this is really freeing the song from this kind of i'm gonna narrate it simply and you're gonna you know the audience can have that kind of experience in their head as they're hearing about the story but i feel like this is just a cool way to to kind of punch into oh yeah like what would it feel like to mm. have all your children die i think it feels really appropriate Jack, you live in a block of flats, um, <laughs> and uh, but full props for 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 going full pelt on take it off, take it off, screaming that. Um, I had one take of that. I was, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> one take of that for banging on the wall. <laughs> this to me feels really right, you know. It's so direct. You know, a, lo a lot of traditional singers <clears throat> will tell you that part of the beauty of it is that we're not prescribing what our listeners think. I feel like that's one fork in the road. That's like mm. a beautiful mm. fork where it's like, okay, are the words enough? I guess what I'm trying to say is that the traditional singing has this like this deep trust in if I say the words, does that give you a strong enough image in your head for you to understand like some pain or I, I think for me, it's like, I also believe in this other fork of the road where sometimes yeah. I'm like, you know what? I don't think that people are getting it. Like, yeah, I want yeah, yeah. to show with the sounds like like what does trauma feel like and what does like <laughs> depression feel like all these other genres are not about that they're like mm. oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know like you're not like and then she was sad 
<laughs> you know, yeah. it's just to- two totally different approaches, but I think it's, I think that's where some of the tension between traditionalists and non-traditionalists, it's like when they say, oh, that's not how it used to be. I kind of want to say, do you just believe in the words? Like, mm. do you want to be omniscient? Do you want to like create this very unbiased listening experience for the mm. audience? Like, I feel like actually traditional music is closer to like the way that people who do music concrete think of music or like my partner it does he's a sound artist and so I feel like he loves music where it's just kind of you get put in a room and you're not told to do or feel any particular thing you just kind of have an experience like he doesn't Mm. like music where it's like here's what I'm feeling and (laughs) you should feel that too yeah, I feel like that's where I don't really want to care about genre because I, mm. I feel like when p- traditionalists are saying it needs to be the certain way, I'm like, I don't think you've actually thought through musically why you believe it. Like, I I trust you, but mm. it's not, I don't think it's because it's traditional. I think it's because mm. you believe in a certain relationship to your audience or a certain yeah, way okay. of telling a story like yeah no I think that's really interesting and I I, I totally respect like that way of doing things as well and mm. I think there's something in it about um wanting to get rid of hierarchies isn't there it's about this idea that like if this artist comes in and is presenting this show that's really designed to make you feel this way it's a little bit dominant isn't it it's like the artist can be seen right. to be dominating an audience and I respect that you'd want to dismantle that and you want to look yeah. at ways of like freeing an audience and having an audience more involved with it i don't know man i like alice cooper <laughs> you know <what> I, mean? <laughs> yeah. I agree with because i mean i love i love so much music that's so emo and a lot of like amazing protest music is mm. that you know yeah. or like nina simone is is like i'm angry and you should hear like mississippi yeah. goddamn yeah like there is this other argument too that like to create a space where the audience can just feel what they want is this way of this passivity because the status quo is racist and mm, sexist. So you're not and, taking responsibility for that if yeah, you just reproduce so it. I wrote about your version, like there's this part that was really moving about imagining this very female <clears throat> quiet rage in the language of this kind of usually male, like, like this kind of mm. energy and and to have the voice of a of a woman grieving her children like mm. be given that kind of rage i'm like yeah like it <laughs> it's not just about like this nice old lady singing this nice old song about a woman who's sad that's part of also the the argument of wait as artists shouldn't we try mm. to make people feel a little bit uncomfortable and mm. poke at things mm. and ask questions and like that's such a great debate that moment where she screams i wish the winds never cease i was ple- i was really pleased with that when i first got it and put that guitar chord in and that was when i first was like oh yeah i just need loads of distorted guitar in this yeah. but i totally picture her on top of like a hill or a cliff yeah. looking out to sea and she's like i put a curse on the world until my sons come back to me i wish the wind Till my three sons come home to me Come home in flesh and blood As much as I love talking about myself (laughs) (laughs) We should have a listen to the next track in the playlist So first up, contributions, we've got Kev Pritchard with Lady Gay Should we have a little listen? Yeah. yeah. She set a table both long and wide And on it put bread and wine Come eat, come drink, my three little babes Come eat and drink of mine Yeah, there's no winners in art, but this <laughs> won some prize of like, it's more like a yearbook. This one had best textures, textural combinations of those weird 
kazoos and booming, very amorphous bass thing and the um, bottles. Yeah, the bass is him blowing over the top of a bottle. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting a lot out of the yeah. instrument, <laughs> using every part cool. of the pig. <laughs> it's just kind of a, it is like a creepy, freaky mm. uh, set of textures altogether. Yeah, I think yeah. it's funny. He had a similar problem to what I had where he was not following a metronome very precisely and has fallen off the grid with, <laughs> with Garage Band. Same problem, yeah. Yeah, a very kind of disjointed feeling to it. Of, mm. of, it becomes less about the beat and more about the textures yeah, in that yeah. sense. And that's what's so cool about the old recordings too. Like no one's <laughs> it's yeah. Not yeah. precise. In our, one of the intros to one of our episodes, we made a little joke about whether you've got uh, just a milk bottle uh, you know a kazoo milk and, and some kazoo. old milk bottles <laughs> yeah. or something and so I think um, Kev's gone and taken that literally like, that's <laughs> a good idea <laughs> yeah oh yeah he said I hope I don't come across too earnest about the novelty take on kazoo and bottles yeah yeah but I think it's really good that's, I mean yeah, to be absolutely. honest absolutely I think it works really well yeah shout out to there are these moments of like variation in vocal the rise up part where mm. just the melody changed slightly and I was mm. like <gasps> I encourage more of that. Actually, my favourite moment in it was when you come out of the instrumental and there's a real clatter of milk bottles which just builds up until it suddenly stops. I thought that was a really good moment. There's a little sound in there somewhere which sounds sounds a bit like a smash. Yeah. It's either a smash or just some keys being chucked on a table or something. But it's like, (laughs) that really unsettles me. That's great. I assumed he'd got to the end of the recording session, all this blowing over a hitting with, he was like, right, get rid of it. Disposable (laughs) instrument. (laughs) Brilliant. So next up in the playlist are two takes by Rory Wells. We're going to play a snippet of the one with just clarinet and guitars now, but go and listen to both tracks. They're both quite different, really worth a listen. I think the um, clarinet part is so strong. It's so strong and cool. And it totally reminds me of the Carinx, which is that Celtic war horn that they mentioned. Have you oh, seen that? Oh, right. No. Oh, my God. They're so amazing. Okay. For Radioland, you can look it up, but it's like these long horns. They're so long and they have like a dragon or serpent or lion like there's like an a monster head is right. the bell and their sound is so wild and cool and it was apparently this like bronze age celtic instrument that was like a war instrument and this idea of like they're going to fight the romans and this sound of this otherworldly like wild scary but beautiful sound like coming out of the woods and the Celts, like, yeah. try to fight the Romans is kind of, like, what I imagine. <laughs> and I also, I don't know how to pronounce this pagan holiday. Oh, called... yeah, Samhain, do you think? Yeah, Samhain? it's the Gaelic festival marching, uh, marking the end of harvest season. So it's kind of like when we started to put a Halloween. Oh, and I right, think yeah. that it also is, like, a moment when there's, like, an open passage, an open door between... The world of the dead and the world of the living. Which is interesting because we talked quite a lot about trying to work out what the significance of Martin Mass and, yeah. and things like that was. And, right. and the thing is, but the idea that this song is older than than any of that. I, I did stumble across a version where they specifically come and spend one night with her, and it's when the cock crows yeah. that they have to go back. Like I want to hear a whole like long composition with clarinets yeah. with that vibe. It's almost like the ceremony of calling the dead children. You know, just thinking about when are there like collective rituals for things and when did those get kind of destroyed by various forces and become these moments of loneliness? Say this story is happening on this night that's a holiday for this culture. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's receiving the dead and everyone in their houses across this land are are waiting for like all of a sudden I feel like she's less lonely. 
Right. Mm. Like there's this grief, but it's also like, you know, the next day there's like, who else, who received who, like, oh, who did you receive? Oh, you received your father. Mm. Oh, you received. And there's just, I feel like, oh yeah, what is the version or the culture in which this story is not lonely at all? Like that yeah. there is mm. grief, but not loneliness. There's yeah. like missing these people, but like, that's what we do. I love the way that this version kind of, yeah, it makes me think of these more, these older ideas of what this night might have mm. been about. Cool. Yeah. Next up, we've got, so this is the Monkey Town Milk Spillers uh, on Mr. Cat Hair's SoundCloud profile. At the break of day, then babes come a run She set the table for them to eat. Upon it, spread bread and wine. Come eat, come eat, my three little babes. Come eat, come drink of mine. Mmm. I am so up for this one. That is so great. Isn't it? You know what? Every time it ends, I'm so ready for it to go back into it. Yeah. <laughs> but I think this is just such a smart use of that style to tell mm. the story. Another garage band one. Which I'm right. really impressed with. It's mostly put together by one guy, isn't it? And then has he got a trumpet player and a, and a singer as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I but love he's the dr- playing the drums and the guitar and bass, presumably. On it. Yeah, yeah. I love the relatively dry vocals as well. You know, she's mm. right in your ears, kind of thing. It kind of gets it takes on a slight, slightly ghostly character as it goes on with some of the harmonies and some of the um, the kind of trumpet playing. But I mean, that, that's that kind of New Orleans funeral march style. Yeah, it's vibe. funny because when people say trad, this is what I think of. Right, interesting. <laughs> uh-huh. like the word trad is this for me. It is influenced by Saint James Infirmary, uh, which was famously done by Louis Armstrong. But it's all his. They're also talking about this idea that a lot of British folk songs. I did find their way into like American popular forms as well as being picked up by American traditional music. So like that being one, but like House of the Rising Sun is another funny one that's like mm-hmm. an old British folk song and then like, well, via like Alan Lomax into the hands of the animals mm-hmm. and then obviously something totally different. These are all such different um, movies. <laughs> 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 like car- almost like cartoon feel like it's funny a, like an yeah. old cartoon yeah because like in the same way as like those folk songs made their way into american popular music like it's it's similar to how disney was picking up folklore and like totally yeah. retelling folk stories like that was still the material we continue to tell the same stories roughly and the same stories continue to resonate I heard, I sort of heard this sentiment from a few people saying here, I was moved by Anna's description of their version of the song. However, we seem to be bigger hams and our version of the song ended up more as a theatrical gothic ghost story. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I heard this from a few people. I think it's important to say like, you've got to do what you want with it. We have these chats as an introduction and like, mm. I, actually, oh. to be honest, I felt like after our chat, like, oh, I've got to take this really seriously. I've got to really take on board everything yeah. Anna said. You know, totally. you shouldn't feel any pressure. I just wish there was more talking about this sort of being strong in your own version and your own interpretation. Mm. That's not part of the training of ballad singers. I didn't learn about like how, how do you like take a stand and be strong with it? I feel like that you learn from like David Bowie. I like like that this version really was kind of saying, well, what about like, let's talk about ghosts more. Like, yeah. is it yeah, always yeah, yeah. just sad? Great. I love that. Uh, hope to hear more from the Monkey Town Milk Minx. Yeah. Oh, not <laughs> <a> mix, <thinkers. laughs> the Monkey Town Milk Spillers. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've got Back to Me by John Don Piver next. Man, those pitch bends. I yeah. love it. It's so good, isn't it? Yeah, I love also just having a new song, just working with the ideas in it. Using the cold clay. I think the next few mm. takes going to lean on cold clay very heavily. 
Yeah. Which well, was such an evocative lyric for me. I think that's brilliant. Cold clay hangs over my head. I just love those pitch bends. Like it really does something to me. It really reminds me of a band called Super Organism. Does anyone know Super uh, Organism? Yeah. Yeah. There's one of their tracks where they've got this big pitch bend off, and oh, it really. And into a silence as well. There's a couple of times where it bends, and you're just left like <laughs> it's great. It shifts the ground mm, mm. that you're you think you're resting on. To yeah, have so yeah, yeah. much pitch pitch shifted. It's like yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Oh, it's underused. Apparently, it's a built-in effect in Ableton. He's done it with. I'm gonna be uh, probably gonna be stealing that. <laughs> I really like how the beat develops in the second verse. Like when that little because yeah. there's so little going on in the verses, but the development's really yeah. good. Like in the first verse, halfway through, you get that click coming in, mm. and then the second one, there's that little pop sort of sound. Really nice sound. It's just enough, isn't it? Minimal it is, yeah. Arrangement. Yeah, it's quite, I, I find it's, it's got quite a Radiohead feel, which some people mm. don't think is a compliment, but I think it is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like, you know, I think it's got a really kind of sultry vibe to it. I like what he's done with, I think the second verse is all about this sort of religious, this faith aspect and like, he won't lift a finger to help that. It's almost, it's very pessimistic. I'm not actually quite sure whose voice that is at that point, but. Um, yeah. There's like a cool po polemical vibe at the beginning, like this mm. kind of, this is what you should do, take care. It falls apart in a way like this kind mm. of, no matter what you do to try to protect or what walls you, you build. Really catchy. I really like this one. Yeah, it's really, really strong. Next up is Cold Clay Hangs Over My Head by Catafolk. Lovely droniness. Totally in mono, isn't it? He says he's added a bit of reverb in Garage Band to give it a bit right. more stereo ness, but yeah. Because it's recorded live, this one, right? Yeah. Just one oh. take straight into Garage Band. Yeah, yeah. Um, with, with like live effects. Yeah, with massive mm -hmm. effects pedal. Cool. <laughs> uh, once again, Catafocus sent us his uh, very detailed breakdown of his entire effects. Oh, chain. oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Every, you see that. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, I'm going to read this part of what they say. You can blame Wikipedia for my dark take. Ah, Wikipedia. <laughs> this song implicitly draws on an old belief that one should mourn death for a year and a day. Mm. For any longer might cause the dead to return. That's cool. Oh, and then there's something about revenants. Yes. Yeah. So Zombies. In his mind, the children were the dead children. It wasn't ghosts. Yeah. They were like reanimated Whoa. and the mother mm. refuses to acknowledge it. Yes. Much more morbid thing yeah, than yeah, I yeah. had Super in my head. Super dark. This is quite a beat for Catafolk, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my favourite things I've heard from Catafolk because I can I can really make the melody yeah, yeah. out. Call me a Philistine. <laughs> <laughs> but I love the way it snakes out. He's still taking loads of time around it. For me, it's just the right pace, snaking yeah, through. Totally. I think. There's a point where there's a kind of a longer pause and then it comes back in mm -hmm. with the octave below. Yeah. And that's there's a fat, real, isn't it? There's a real dread at that point for me. Yeah. On a technical yeah. note, we put the reverb pedal before the fuzz pedal. Putting fuzz on reverb is just yeah. not something I've done before. Jack, since reading that, I've tried that on a track and I love it. Yeah. I, mean, I think I'm going to use that a lot now. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. I'm coming back to that. That's cool. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I love it. On to the summer vibes of Asymptotes now with Cole Clay. There you go. So that was Asymptotes with Cold Clay. It has lots of Asymptotes elements, in particular the chopped up vocals in the background, which is uh, some of you may recognise, or I think 
probably won't recognize as my acapella version. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, this is the one where it got used, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah which yeah. is I'm really pleased about. But you can hear that kind of uh, warping about in the background. Mm. Summary track, uh, summary, but not happy. But hopefully right. she says she doesn't feel much connection with her childhood. So hearing this tune echo the grief and loss that she felt feels there. Uh, and that's something that she's needed to consciously let go of. So I think this is once again, an interesting way to take a theme, a latent theme from uh, a ballad and kind of drag it into your, your own understanding, yeah. your own life. I love this idea. Like the tune echoed the grief and loss I feel that's something I've needed to consciously let go of. That is part of this process, the moment of being told to let go or something. Like there is this letting go mm. invitation in this version, not specific to the ballad, but this just kind of like lightness, like let there be lightness and hope as they mentioned. That mm. I, that's really cool because these old ballads, so many of them are in these like very fraught like we're holding on yes. like, we're not yeah, gonna yeah. like whether it's like we're not gonna let go of the tradition we're gonna hold it so tight or like i'm not gonna let go of my pain i'm mm. just gonna relive it again and again like there's <laughs> make this you relive it. <laughs> there can be this parallel so it's like that tight grip is is released in this yeah, the note yeah. in the description here is really strong, actually. It says, we kill our old selves and make new ones every single day. Doesn't mean we're not made from the same stuff. Uh, this is I've, in the soundtrack I've, like, clicked through to the song. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's good, isn't it? Yeah, that's really beautiful. It's very, um, it's almost like I wish the person in the song could be reminded that. <laughs> like, <laughs> could hear this track, you know? <laughs> Great. Great. Good Great stuff. Track. So coming up now, we've got Paul and Steve Moisey. With Lovely. White of Bush as well. North country to learn the grammary. They'd not been gone but a very short time, scarcely six weeks to the day when death called death spread through. Yeah, lovely stuff. Mm. I love that last verse, a cappella. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I love the singing. It's really mm. beautiful. It's like a perfect example of when like folk music is slight, like slightly pitchy at times, but it's, mm. don't care. Like mm. it's yeah. beautiful. Like there's this kind of like losing of pitch sometimes that feels that I super trust the vocal. Like mm. I trust the singer. Like mm. I believe you. So that none of all of that falls like it becomes more of this beautiful texture or quality of like this falling off. Like, oh, I think the arrangement is is really cool. They say, oh, the the recording's a bit ropey, which is kind of true, but it's a great arrangement. I think it's recorded on a laptop mic, though. So you yeah, give so. Yeah, much, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that double bass sounds great. I think. I think that sounds cool. I think also panning decisions have really helped this. So, like, if recording's a bit ropey and you put everything down the middle, then everything melt melts into one. Right. Yeah. But there's mm -hmm. there is enough space in here that everything's clear and it's yeah. Uh, I was saying that, that I really like this, the string, uh, repeated string patterns, the Austin uh -huh. I was saying that that's a thing that I, I find myself layering up since like that. Um, you know, just getting a few sequences going and mm. just layering stuff up like that. And I thought it's just really cool to hear that in an acoustic setting, someone taking that same principle, applying to this and, and it almost takes on the character of a drone. Yeah. Uh, you've got this higher pattern which is these repeating notes which keep coming back and, and you've got movement there but there's also um has the same same effect as a drone it made me think a lot of banjo you know this kind of question of how what do you do to take a kind of unmetered ballad and how do you put it to like an instrument that wants to play rhythms or chord mm. like like that question came up over 100 years ago like when mm. people were white people were learning banjo there's all these great early like buell kazee and all these interesting banjo players where yeah you just kind of have this ostinato at the bottom this person is kind of saying like i i love techno and i'm like coming from that place to like make this thing and then i'm 
and then it kind of to me circled back to like well it sounds like a banjo um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like that there is this idea of like you have this very floaty rhythm and then you let the voice float on top of that I thought that was really well done oh like Lori Spiegel the kind of early synth composer she has a whole kind of set of tunes called Appalachian Grove she also plays the banjo and she was working at Bell Labs and yeah it's it's another piece where you're, you're like yes the connection between like synthesized pattern music mm. and you know early computer music and then this banjo as a pattern generator is is like yeah. a very apt connection and um but yeah this really i think it's really it's cool okay next in the playlist we've Go. Okay, Matt. Here we go, Matt Milton. Yeah, Matt Milton. Let's have a listen. The green grass lies at our heads. The clay lies at our feet. And your tears come tumbling down and wet our winding sheets. And the cock had barely crowed the once, nor clapped it. I really like this song. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. I really liked it. I was, yeah, wow, that was so good. Yeah, I was super into that one. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because it's so simple, but like this, this, there's a few things about it which I think are just really interesting. Just these little moments of weirdness. Yeah, yeah. Like, whew, this was like probably a speech Elizabeth heard so many times where I was just like, everything's so relative, like experimentation or what people think of as experimental. It's like, well, just like you set up an expectation and then you slightly break it. Mm, and, yeah, and like okay. this yeah. this does this so well where kind of you get into this plotting and the voice is like so simple and like well and then there's just these moments of silence and like those weird mm. notes and like yeah i was like oh okay like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah wow. the, the bits in between the verses captivate yeah. me because it's it's really quiet all of a sudden where it's been yeah. like quite confident guitar playing mm. then it's suddenly yeah. like what's that about it's really interesting and then right yeah, at the end it's almost like tapping it's almost like mm. yeah. a hammering on sort of thing on on the strings which is really really good little fills fascinating so they say this is based on the martin carthy version which they, right. they regard as a, a sort of definitive but they were they're encouraged by this podcast to try try something a bit different also influenced by guitarist Derek bailey and a bit of thelonious monk in there which i, I can definitely hear yeah. sort of spiky notes and it's like you're saying with yeah. the last one you're in the room it's like yeah. and I'm, I'm imagining there's a fireplace uh, yeah <laughs> well it's it's just very musical you know like mm. there's something about the timing it kind of reminds me of um i'm a pretty uh, he, giant fan of phil and cast tyler god they have this one version of a ballad that i think elizabeth and i listen to like <laughs> we've had it on repeat and you're just like, this is the most incredible folk track ever from their record called The Hind Wheels of Bad Luck. And it's just called Courting as a Pleasure. Uh, they're amazing. They mm. like, well, like Kath is American and she is connected to our friend Tim Erickson. They had this experimental folk band. Wow. Called Cordelia's Dad. I feel like they were weird folk musicians in the trad scene in a time where like so less of that was happening. They were, they loved shape note music and were just mm. kind of a punky band anyway. But it reminds me of this track we just listened to. It's like, has this, you're like, how is this so captivating? Like almost nothing is happening, but it's just the timing is so beautiful. Like there's just this kind of special sauce mm. about about the timing. I think it's it's like when yeah. you decide to make an arrangement with very few elements, there is the potential to like really make it. Mm, you can play with that silence in really powerful ways because a lot most of the versions we've heard have very little silence in them yeah mm. and so this one is really kind of like allowing for a lot of silence which i think you can just create a lot of wonderful tension with that mm. well great, great job that great job matt one. yeah fantastic yeah. matt really enjoyed um, that next up is harry all oh, yeah three little bass. so sweet 
Take it off, take it off, said the oldest one. Take it off, take it off, said she. I can't stay here in this wild, wicked world. For there's a better one for me. Yeah. It's so cool, isn't it? It's got a real yeah. strut, this one. Cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It makes me realize how few versions have been kind of in, I don't know, like there's a whole like Nick Cavey, mm. like, like a band, like this is kind of a rock song, mm. like a, this one really, I was like, oh yeah, there's rhythm, cool. Mm. <laughs> like, like, it's got a bit of a Rai Kuda vibe or like cocaine, you know. <laughs> it yeah. really highlighted like the the cool Texas Gladden. Like it made a lot of really smart choices about how to fit in the, that version. I feel like Sam Amidon does this really well too, where it's like you put a rhythm and then you have this song and it's kind of like the way that you place the text can be a place of surprise i mean i feel like sam comes from like there's like an arthur russell school of like how you put out words and you're you're taught it's like closer to talking but like mm. you know it's a it's more modern feeling um and i feel like this had a lot of great moments of the rhythm is not questioned like yeah just have this like okay like we're all like kind of bobbing back and forth and i'm going to tell you a story while we're bobbing back and forth yeah, and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes i'm engaging with this rhythm as i talk but sometimes i'm not and like these moments where you crystallize that you're being making a really cool rhythmic choice with where mm. you put the word like the, i thought there was a lot of cool moments like that yeah mm. like just little bits that just kind of uh make you sit up i think the the constantly uh -huh. like shifting major minor relationships Mm. are really cool like it's it's like not too much that it's token i think i think where yeah. you sat them are really clever for listeners i want to say anna's been bobbing her head since the track finished <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <it has. laughs> you can't see it but no <laughs> yeah, just rocking <laughs> I, I think i really needed that I yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Harry says that the percussion actually is mostly just him hitting himself. It was like heartbeat rhythm. Yeah. Right. That was well done. Because it wasn't, you know, I feel like I've heard version like mm. uses of a heart like beat and you're like, oh yeah, it's because her heart's pounding. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this felt much, you know, this was very tasteful use of, of that kind of idea. I think the vocals sound really good. Like they're not really mm. bright and crisp, but they're like a little bit dirty, basically, mm. aren't they? I think that's really nice too. He's, he set it quite low for uh, to have that many harmonies in, mm -hmm. and I think to do that, you know, it has to be quite smart with how you arrange them. Um, I love that last little thing at the end. It kind of sounds like gets really crunchy, and then the last note just switches to the major. But what's going on with that drum outro? It's like some wow. sort of tremolo or delay, or oh um, yeah, it's getting mm. all like. <sighs> he says he's just automating the rate knob of a tremolo yeah. on an amp emulator. Uh, yeah, fantastic track from him. Yeah, it's a great cool. job. <laughs> Kerry Safana with the wife, wife of us as well. Yeah. Yeah. Listen. That's yeah. awesome. The notes are so great mm. <laughs> after my own heart because they're like, I got a bit meta. And so it's two ballads, but okay, these characters from these different ballads are actually part of this larger story. It's so great. And I know Elizabeth would appreciate that too. We, yeah, we were like, our our last record, we're like, oh my gosh. And this character is actually like, this is the song <laughs> from this character. Right. Like it's very, it's like not fan fiction, but it kind of feels that where you're kind of saying like, kind of putting all these narratives together and saying, actually, this is one bigger story. Mm, it's mm. like folk you know? meets the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Most ambitious crossover event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> this superwoman from, you might know her from The Wife of Usher as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
yeah, I think that's it's so strong, and I I think uh, it, it really picks up that the storytelling center of the music, and and to also to have those two melodies like in your conversation is like so great. I think a couple of times it takes off with that cold clay, cold clay, and oh, it yeah, really gets really. me both times once they just leap up there. It's amazing. I think totally. Uh, we talked a bit about on the previous takes of like using a, an acoustic acoustic instruments but in a way that is probably more familiar to people who are, who are using doing electronic music or you uh-huh. know, pop production i think keris is nailing this on some of these tracks mm-hmm. the like i love those little the um kind of like string uh swipes up yes I think those the, are the great starts it just really punctuates it all Harmony's yeah great um yeah i think when it kicks off with that slide it's just like oh this is something right different. we're into it now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. She said she wasn't too happy with the vocal sound. I think it sounds great. Mm. Mm. Disagree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can be your own worst critic critic on vocal yeah. takes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. It manages to feel really like complex. Like the layers of many all the different things that are going on somehow like help you engage with like the, the oh, this is a complex story. I wanna listen again. Mm. Oh, I wanna engage again. Like mm. you know, I think some of the 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 interpretations are like leaned into the the drone part of it. Like, oh, this is like a dirge. This is like we repeat. Oh, like there's a simplicity. And I think this, like judging from their notes, they're like, there is this kind of story interest like they in their work, like that they're mm. they're kind of, oh, the story is complex. And I I I feel like that comes through in this arrangement. Mm-hmm. Super strong. Yeah. Just yeah. Really cool. Just just really great all around. Yeah. Cool. cool. We've got Ian's take. This is Three Sons of Usher's Well. Yes, we died under a big blue sky while the sun was shining bright. Gun smoke and dust from our horses' feet. As they fell down by our side, by our side, by our side. So wait, this is has some new words or so he's basically he has combined cool. the, the kind of concept of the wife of the usher as well with the charge of the light brigade. So in his song, the three boys going off to war. Uh, and they get killed in the charge of the light brigade. It kind of has a similar thread with the last version too. Crossover like putting event. in parts. Yeah, so a lot of it's the prelude of this mm. ballad. This like leads up to the key point, really, because mm. we get the mother at the end begging the, a god to send her kids back or, or some higher power or whatever it is. But we never find out if her wish was fulfilled or not. Out in the cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know from previous conversations with Ian, he'll walk around and sort of think about a song and then... It'll just go down on the notepad, get the guitar uh-huh. out, get it on the laptop and just get it out, which uh, it's a great process. It just feels so, it's so lovely for all of us listening to be at the receiving end of people's thought processes about this song. It's like tying it with that poem. Yeah, it just illuminates a whole other idea of what the song could be, like this very specific story. And it's. Do you know the poem? I'd never heard this poem. I had to Google the Light Brigade. <laughs> I didn't know it either. Cannon to the left of them. Cannon to the right of them. Cannon in front of them. That's stuck in the middle with you, Tim. Uh, is it? Well, but it's also Cannon the charge of the, the left of me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, you're right. But they're, they're citing the charge of the light brigade, okay. which I think predates that song by, you know, a good 150 years. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea when it was written. Yeah. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the light brigade charged for the guns, he said, into the valley of death rode the 600. I think the inference of this is like, you know, they've got no chance they're going to win. They're right. going to throw themselves into, into this uh, conflict just for the sheer glory of it. I think Ian's actually doing something pretty smart by using the story to then go, well, what's the what's the damage of that? And mm. it's, of course, it's a mother at home who's, you know, mm. lost her three sons. So, I mean, I think I think there's something really cool about taking a, an established uh, song or poem or trope or story and, and bolting on another perspective. Mm. Yeah. Um, cool. cool. I think that's the end of the list. Yeah. Everyone did an yeah. amazing job. <laughs> yeah, everyone did. <laughs> Was it what you're expecting, Anna? Yes and no. Yeah, each version had a surprise element i felt like it yeah. was that kind of challenge like kind of challenged the way i thought of the ballad or kind of 
asked us to hear a different, to kind of focus in on a different bit of it. I feel like what's not surprising is I, I feel like I want more. Like, <laughs> yeah. like my brain is kind of, even though I've heard a mil- it's a lot to listen to so many mm-hmm. versions, it's also feels like it's so fascinating that we get to listen to so many interpretations of one mm. thing. And that feels like it inspires such a rich conversation to see how how people are responding to the exact same thing. Just yeah, yeah, this yeah. interest in that multitude of mm. versions and interpretations and it just feels so rich to me and so mm. so ex- it's so it's kind of a way to to a little window into another person. It kind of frees this idea of versions away from what I think of as a more kind of capitalist thing when you're trying to make a record and make like a exciting folk record you know you're Mm. trying to say like this is my sound and my or whatever like you it you just end up engaging in all this stuff that's you know that puts more emphasis on like who's a performer and in this scene and who's not or who released which record on which label and Mm. like or who gets this gig or not and you know i'm grateful obviously, to be able to perform and to have people want to come hear a version I make. But I, there's also part of me that's always been really uncomfortable with, with doing that with folk music. Like there's part of it that I'm just like, like everyone should be invited to make their own version and have mm. it be really listened to and really appreciated. And like, oh, you think that about that song? Huh, cool. Like mm. we don't know who wrote this. So it's this collectively held thing i mean martin carthy is amazing but he, like he doesn't get to have a definitive version just because he's right. really really good at guitar i mean mm. he is really really good he has gifts but we all do like we all have the right to have this interpretation of how of how we think the ballad should go or how, what we connect with in the ballad i love that this podcast i feel, I feel like is is encouraging that kind of like Let's listen to each other's versions mm. and, and kind of poke away at that idea of that there is a definitive version mm-hmm. because, you know, we all have these folk records that we love like I do. And, you know, you start to say, oh, this is so-and-so's version. And, and that's part of how it goes. And and it's part of the place where people try to get ownership on a, you know, mm-hmm. you put your stamp on something or something. But it, I also feel very resistant to that because I don't know the ver- – like – the versions of people a hundred years ago. Mm, we just don't yeah. know who made a cool version and whose version I didn't like and who, you know, but there were hundreds of people singing the song. Mm. Hundreds. And we've inherited it through a few people who carried it into the 20th century and were recorded. And we're super grateful because they were the stubborn ones who kept <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> and yeah. so we honor them for being that being stubborn and for holding on. But it's also like their versions came from each version represents like dozens and dozens of people. And so I don't know. It feels like this feels like kind of embracing that collectiveness about this is not music that anyone owns. Mm. And so what does that mean? And how do we like how do we enact that idea of collectiveness Mm. um, as opposed to to trying to like make a definitive version just Mm. to say, wow, like let's rid that from our folk scene vocabulary. There's no definitive version. Mm. There could be a version you really like. There's so many. I don't know. I that's that's my uh, I don't know. It's (laughs) Great. I think we couldn't have asked for a more perfect first guest to kick the well, year no, off. Not at it's all. been yeah. so good. It's been so <laughs> fun. It's yeah, it's so nice to be able to talk about these things. Cool. Yeah, I this is a great show. Great job, you guys. Oh, thank you. That's oh, like that for you guys. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Just get to listen to music, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Wow, what a fantastic episode. It's so much to think about. I really don't think this song is going to go away anytime soon. No, not at all. Well, a huge thanks to everyone who submitted a track for this episode. It's a real pleasure for us to hear such a range of responses to Anna's challenge. If you've put together a tape but not managed to get it in in time, or if you're listening in the future and you want to have a go, please send us a link anyway. We'd love to hear it and we'll definitely give it a share across our social media pages. We'll be back in a week's time on Monday 19th of April with comedian Stuart Lee, who will be introducing us to Willie of Winsbury. If you want to get started a bit early, there's chords, lyrics, scores and playlists of versions we like on the website at oldtunesfreshtakes.com. 
If you're interested in getting even deeper into the conversation, then we've set up a group on Facebook and you'll find a link in the description. There's been some amazing conversation already over the last month or so and people have been sharing their demos, feedback and ideas. If you've enjoyed the episode, please tell your friends and share it around. You can like it and leave a comment on SoundCloud. Or if you're listening on a podcast service like Apple Music, you can often leave a review. All of these things really help out the podcast and mean we'll have even more fresh takes in the future. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you again next week.